Hello everybody, it's me, Julian, and today I would like to talk about Alenka Zupancic's book, The Ethics of the Real. And this is a book that Slavoj Žižek in the introduction says that he was envious of, that as he was reading it, he started doubting his own strength as a philosopher, wishing that he would have come up with the ideas and the connections that she was making. And this is part of Žižek's compliment. He says that if he simply said that he approved of the book, it would be a little bit aloof, like he was her mentor. Instead, the most genuine compliment for Zizek, for another philosopher, is that he experiences envy, that he wishes he could have written the book himself. And it's important to note that Alenka Zupancic's ideas are very closely related to those of Zizek, and they've worked at the same school. In fact, he often quotes and mentions her work in his own books. So what I'd like to do in this short video is give you a brief introduction to her central argument in the ethics of the real, which I should say is a really exciting and interesting argument. Her basic argument is that an ethical decision always comes to us as a disturbance, as an interruption of sorts, something that we don't want to do that confronts us with the true object of our desire. For example, in the movie Batman, when Batman has to choose between saving Harvey Dent and Rachel, it reveals, to Har it reveals to Batman that more than his love for Rachel, he loves the idea of being the Batman. And it's a traumatic truth, a traumatic insight. And what I'd like to do here is to basically outline this argument in simple terms. What is the ethics of the real and why is it important for Zupancic? So Zupancha's basic argument works like this. She says, there are essentially two ways of conceptualizing ethics. We have traditional trad ethics, going all the way back from Aristotle to Bentham. The basic objective of traditional ethics is to instruct the subject how to live virtuously in accordance with the good. And then we have what you might call postmodern ethics, the ethical framework that emerges after modernism in which the preservation of the self is the highest good, a more individualistic form of ethics. And Zupancha says that this is why the conservative framing of a return to traditional ethics and traditional values, etc., can often be so appealing because we live in a time in which the emphasis is placed on preserving your own self above and beyond the idea of others. However, her attempt is not a return to go back to traditional values, but instead to posit what you might call a new value system, a new conceptual framework for ethics, what she calls the ethics of the real. And the three central thinkers in her argument are Kant and Kantian ethics, as well as Freud and Lacan. She argues that Kant was the first to make a break with traditional ethics by essentially observing two things. One, that ethics never occurs on the level of possibility, but instead on the level of impossibility. In fact, the central maxim, du Kant den du sollst, is already an expression of ethics as impossibility. G.K. Chesterton actually has a similar idea when it comes to forgiveness. He says, Strictly speaking, the only acts that we can forgive are those which are unforgivable, i.e. if it weren't unforgivable, it wouldn't really be forgiveness, it would simply be tolerance. Which is to say, the more difficult it is to forgive something, the more it is a genuine act of forgiveness. And Kant makes a similar argument apropos ethics. If it is something that we can simply do, if it is within the realm of possibility, it's not strictly speaking ethical. If it's something that presents itself as an impossibility, as something which we have to do, it is an ethical act. Zizek actually has a pretty good example of this that I like to refer to, where he says, imagine a situation in which somebody passes out in the street and everybody just walks by as if nothing were happening, except you decide to call an ambulance. You decide to rescue this person. Later, somebody asks you, why did you do it? When nobody else would, why were you the one who chose to act? And your response might well be, well, because I had no choice. Here we have the Kantian 
ethical choice against the backdrop of impossibility, which is to say you chose to act ethically like a hero, as it were, precisely because in that moment it seemed to you as if you had no choice. Of course you had to act. Therefore, the first break that, Tra that Kant makes with traditional ethics is to set it against the background of impossibility instead of possibility. The second break that Kant makes with traditional ethics is to resist the idea that ethics is about a distribution of the good. In other words, that ethical behavior isn't simply about doing the right thing so as to create a better world, like one candle that lights another. Instead, for Kant, there's once again an impossibility in this distribution of the good. Here it might serve to actually look at Tolstoy. Tolstoy in his later Christian phase encountered a similar problem. Tolstoy was very much in favor of kindness. He said that nothing makes the world better than kindness. It makes mysterious things clear, dull things interesting, etc. It seemed like a common sense observation about the power of kindness. And yet, Tolstoy problematized this notion by saying that there's nothing that he ever regretted more than not being more kind to others retroactively. In fact, he generalizes or universalizes and says, most people, when you ask them what they wish they could have done better, they'll say that they wish they would have been more kind in an unkind situation. Tolstoy's basic argument, therefore, is that whilst we should be kind, that kindness actually emerges too late, that we wish we had been more kind precisely in a circumstance in which we were not kind, in which we were confronted with our own unkindness. This is the Kantian break with traditional ethics. Instead of simply instructing on a moral level how to be good, he essentially assumes the fact that this very desire to be good emerges too late, emerges after the fact as a kind of missed opportunity. And so those are the two breaks that Kant makes with traditional ethics. On the one hand, he sets it against the horizon of impossibility rather than possibility. And he creates what you might call a pre-ontological argument about the fact that morality emerges always too late after the fact. And Zupanches then takes Kant and says that the two thinkers who would radicalize this Kantian break were Freud and Lacan. In fact, she says Freud was one of the first people to essentially argue that the idea of ethics was itself an ideological tool employed by the elite, the cultural hegemonic forces, to suggest that their own position was virtuous. For example, when it comes to colonizing forces, the idea of the white man's burden is a form of this ethical framework by which the colonized other is supposed to be considered racially inferior to the master. In fact, Zizek in his introduction or preface to the book points out that there's an implicit superego injunction here, which is that the colonized other is supposed to be raised up to the level of the white master, and yet secretly the point is that he is never able to, that he must always remain in this, this subservient level. This means that the secret underlying implicit imperative in the ideological ethic is precisely that the other must always remain other and not actually on the quote unquote civilizational level of the master. And then we have the Lacanian interpretation of Kant, Kant of Exad, which essentially argues that Kant is the first thinker of desire. In other words, that the Kantian ethical framework is not simply an ethical framework of morality, but an ethical framework of desire, in which the desire of the subject is revealed back to him. And now we're actually back to Zupanch's argument about the ethics of the real. Her point isn't simply that there's an ethical dimension to the real, but exactly the other way around, that the real always already functions within the ethical that there's an excessive kernel that we can't quite access within the idea of ethics itself, which she breaks down in the terms that I've just laid out before. In fact, her basic argument is that ethics is a form of superego injunction, that it is not simply a normative, neutral, objective framework that governs or guides how we might live, but that the very idea of ethics is indeed pathological that it points to a central impossibility of the subject and therefore emerges as its, excess, as its excessive kernel, as its supplement. 
That is Dupontius' argument in the briefest form possible. I highly recommend that you read The Ethics of the Real or the book that Zizek says that he's envious of. Please do consider becoming a patron so that you can download my lectures and my ebook. Talk to you tomorrow.